Hi. Um, so today we're talking about seeing, right? Or actually we're talking about seeing the unseen, the hidden uh, things that were not seen before or things that are partially unseen. Uh, and that's kind of relative actually because some things that are seen by some are unseen by the others. Uh, some people can see colors where there are none. Uh, some can see different emotions and experiences. Some can see sadness where there isn't any for others. Some can see joy. Some can see racism. Some can see um, of t things that offend them. Uh, I'm a comedian, so I try seeing the ridiculous in everything. Uh, I also have, by the way, my eyesight's minus 12.75. So for me, the unseen is basically anything beyond like here. And, um, but I've been lucky, you know, I've been very lucky so far. I've seen wonderful things, I've seen different things. I've seen, I've seen a kangaroo for the first time. Uh, I've been in Australia a year and a half. It took me that long to see a, a, a kangaroo. It, it took me that long to see a live kangaroo. Um, I'd seen lots of dead ones on the road like great big fleshy speed breakers. But, uh, but I saw a live one finally, it was beautiful. It really was, it was like a five footer, um, and it looked, like a, it looked like a velociraptor covered in suede, and um, it really was, it was amazing. Unfortunately, I saw it coming around a bend, doing 110 kilometers an hour, and, uh, and I swerved, and uh, afterwards, when the policeman came to the crash site, he, uh, he asked me, he's like, what happened? And I, and, and I told him the kangaroo, because it didn't hop in front of me, so much as it just sort of appeared, like, like the road had burped out a demon ghost kangaroo. <laughs> like the spirit of Australia sent it to kill me. And, um, and I told the policeman, I, I was like, I swerved. And the policeman, he actually said this, he goes, you should have hit the bloody thing. You should have hit it. And, uh, and all I could say was, no, no, I can't. Like, you have to understand, I'm an immigrant. Like, I'm pretty sure it looks bad if I kill your national emblem. Like, I'm... <laughs> I'm sure that comes up in a citizenship exam at some point. I just <laughs> don't want to go there. And, uh, and, and, and because what happened was weird. I, I see, I, I swerved the car, and, and the car hit a gravel pitch, and it, and, it, and it went into a spin, and then it flipped. And it kind of came crashing down on the roof, and, uh, and the car then went scraped across like, the Great Eastern Highway in Western Australia for like 100 meters, and with me inside it upside down. And, uh, and, this, and this peculiar thing happens to me when I'm, when I'm frightened. Like, you know, normal people urinate. But um, I, I'm assuming, uh, but, um, but my brain detaches. And, and it becomes like this weird observer that sees things differently from what I'm actually experiencing. And that's what happened. My, like, uh, the car's upside down, it's skidding along, and my brain detached. And my brain kind of said to me, you're a Pakistani, what are you doing in Western Australia suffering death by kangaroo? Like, that makes no sense. And, and it's true, because I, I, and we came here like a year and a half ago, it was me, my wife, and my daughter, and we moved to Australia. Um, and, and it's been wonderful so far, you know. Uh, it's been, we, we moved to rural Western Australia, uh, and the reason for that is because we're on a, a special visa, and the visa says that uh, you know, we can live in Australia for two years, but we have to spend those two years living in rural WA. Um, which I think what that lets us do is it, it lets us feel like we're living in Australia, but also makes us feel like we never left a third world country in the first place. <laughs> I think it's just kind of easing us into the system, I guess. I don't know. Um, but, <laughs> but no, like, it's been wonderful, though. We're trying to settle in, we're trying to assimilate. We've been, I've been trying to learn the Australian national anthem. I'm trying to memorize it. Um, uh, there's one part I keep tripping up over. It's, uh, tell me if I'm getting the wordings wrong. It's, for those who've come across the seas, we've Papua New Guinea's lands to share. That's, that's how it goes, right? Because that's what happened. Like, over the last year, that's like, Australians saw refugees and asylum seekers coming out of the ocean, and they panicked as if they were sharks with legs or something. And, uh, and the government picked up on this panic, and, and the government, for all the cynical reasons, made an announcement that they were going to send a message to the people smugglers by forcing the refugees to live in, uh, in human conditions in detention centers offshore. Which is kind of like saying we're going to send a message to rapists by forcing women to wear a burqa. You know, which, again, as a Pakistani, I understand that, I kind of know where that's coming from. Um, but, but I also have a context for the xenophobia. I, I know where that's coming from, because the town I live in, in, in Western Australia, 
It's a small town, 7,000 people, four bars, two liquor stores, no bookstores, no cinemas, and that's the priority there. And, um, <laughs> and when I moved there, they opened up this thing called the Yonga Hill Immigration Detention Center. It's a massive detention center with uh, like, uh, several hundred refugees from Pakistan, Afghanistan, countries like that. Uh, and there's me walking around town looking like this. Like every time I'd go to Woolies, they'd freak out. Oh my God, one of them got out! You know, just people were <laughs> hysterical. Um, this one woman actually came up to me. This actually happened. She, come up, she comes up to me, this lady, and, and she, goes, uh, she points to the detention center and she goes, what if one of them escapes? What do we do? And she was really panicked, like, what if one of them escapes? And, and that's when I realized for the first time, Australians don't understand boat people. They don't know what they are. So let me try explaining it to you in words that politicians won't use ever. Um, and, and, and the thing with boat people, these people who are risking their lives to come here by boat, these are the good guys. These are doctors and lawyers and physicians and teachers. And these are good guys escaping terrible countries where the bad guys won. There's no, it's not as if like if SEAL Team 6 hadn't killed Osama Bin Laden, he'd be in rural Western Australia eating a meat pie. Like, it wasn't a concern. <laughs> it just didn't happen. So, so when this woman's freaking out, she goes, what do we do when one of them escapes? What do we do? I was like, I don't know, invite him in. He might teach you how to read and fix your teeth. Give that a shot. <laughs> just try it. <laughs> But they're taking our jobs. I hear that one a lot. The refugees are taking all our jobs. What do we do? Be better at your job. <laughs> if... <laughs> if a guy who can't speak the language spent two weeks on a boat on which he lost half his family, then has to spend two years in Nauru and can take your job away from you, then update your LinkedIn profile. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Try it. I mean, like the government says things like they call them queue jumpers. That's an easy one to use. It's a slogan. They're queue jumpers. They're jumping the queue. There's no queue. You understand that, right? There's no orderly lines forming outside the borders of Australia. And even if there were, Australia's an island continent. Where would those lines be forming? In the ocean. What would they be standing on? On boats. That's how it works. Like, <laughs> just. So it's interesting, though, because if you look at Australian policies right now, it seems like the country is waging war on refugees and asylum seekers. And the way the government justifies that is it says that it's doing it because that's what the people want. But I'm in the people. I'm in rural Western Australia where I'm doing shows and I'm doing this exact same material in, in bars and clubs with some more swear words thrown in. And, um, across Western Australia. And, and, and every time I've done it, I've had the same reaction you guys gave me today. Every single time. And I think what happens, and, and this actually happened, people have come up after shows and said, oh, no one ever said it that way, and I now see it differently. And I think that's what happens. I think comedy forces you to see things from a different perspective. And I believe that because I've had experiences that taught me that lesson. Um, I'm from Karachi, like I said. I'm a, it's a city of like 22 million people. Um, and uh, and this happened to me like, uh, just before I left for Australia. There was, I was driving home. See, everyone gets held up in Karachi. Everybody gets held up at gunpoint. It's a very common thing. If you haven't been held up at gunpoint, then you're the guy holding the gun. Like, that's the way it works. <laughs> and that's the rule, you know? Um, and, and, and I was driving home. I stopped at a traffic light, and this guy puts a gun to my head. And he says, give me a phone, give me a wallet. Uh, so, and there's a protocol, you observe that because otherwise you get shot. So I took out my phone, I took out my wallet, and I gave it. And he took the phone, he took the wallet. And I swear to God, I don't know why he said this, but he goes, um, I hope you're not angry with me. <laughs> and, and my brain had done that idiot thing where it detaches at that point. So I turned around and I said, you've got my phone, you've got my wallet, leave me my anger. <laughs> and... <laughs> I don't know. And, and he started laughing. He did. He started laughing. And because, so he starts laughing, so I started laughing. <laughs> so we're both, he's got a gun to my head this entire time. <laughs> and, and we're both laughing. And then I stopped laughing. And because I stopped laughing, he stopped laughing. And then we're both looking at each other. And then we kissed. No, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Up until that point, no. Um, up until that point, it's all true. Um, no, he, uh, he, he, what's, it's actually weirder what's happened. He gave me the phone and wallet back. 
He just gave it back to me, and that never happens. I thought I was in a reality TV show or something. Um, I said, I said, I don't understand. And he, he says, he actually said this. He said, I have to do this. This is what I do. But you're a good guy, and I'm not going to do that to a good guy. And he walked away, and that was it. And I think what happened in that moment was. Because we laughed together, because there was a bit of comedy in our lives for a brief moment, it created a human connection. The facade broke. He was no longer the thief. I was no longer the victim. We were just two people laughing together at a silly joke, and he saw me as a human being. Either that, or he's the worst judge of character ever. I, I, I don't know. I prefer the former, actually.、Um, But sometimes that, that, that's what happens. I think comedy changes things. Sometimes, though,、uh, like it, comedy also forces you to see things that you wish you could unsee.、Uh, this happened very recently, a few weeks ago. In fact, I was on Twitter because I'm a narcissist and I need validation constantly. <laughs> so of course, I'm on Twitter. And、um, and I was on Twitter, and 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 just a, a few days ago, the Taliban the, in Pakistan had just announced that they were going to start attacking the the news channels, the TV channels. And the reason they, they said they, were, they wanted to do this basically because they didn't want the Pakistani public to see the unseen. And in this case, the unseen was the atrocities that the Taliban is committing. And、um, And because I'm an idiot, I was on Twitter and I was saying something like, "Oh, the Taliban complaining about the TV channels is like old people complaining that nothing good is on anymore." And、uh, and and then I went to see who'd written back to me because I'm needy. And、uh, and this one and and it,、uh, there wasn't the usual laughs and stuff. Instead, this actually happened. The official spokesperson for the Taliban was on Twitter and tweeted back at me. And not with a death threat, but he, instead he—and I swear to God—he he tweeted. He goes, "Yes, but our old people have exothermic reactions." And I tweeted back, "Yes, but you've never been around my grandparents after breakfast." <laughs> and 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 this went on until I realized I'm tweeting fart jokes to the Taliban. <laughs> you understand? Never in the history of the world has that sentence been said before. <laughs> and. And the reason I stopped, though, wasn't because of what might end up happening, but it was because people started messaging me and they started saying, "It's so weird. The Taliban have a sense of humor, and I, I can see. I, I, I used to think they're monsters and bar barbaric creatures, but they're human." And I wasn't ready for that responsibility. I didn't want that. I prefer seeing them as barbarians and, and savages. So I, I, I didn't want that anymore. So I blocked him. But I think that's what happened there. I, <laughs> but I do. I, I, I think what happened is that people could see the Taliban as human because they were cracking jokes. It's that simple. So I think if we can see, if comedy can let us see the Taliban as human, or it can make us see, it, it can make a thief see me as a human. Maybe my hope is that it can make, us, make Australians see asylum seekers and refugees as human. And if that happens, then we'll be forced to treat them as humans as well. And that's something worth seeing. Thank you very much.